Thanks for watching, everybody. Um, spending your Good Friday with us today. And I hope it is a Good Friday for everybody. So um, without further ado uh, or delay, I will now bring on my good friend, Mickey Curry. The great Mickey Curry. <laughs> Action. Wow. How about that? Hang on a second. How about now? Oh, I'm hearing you now. Look at that beautiful marine pearl kit behind you there. That's absolutely fantastic. Wow. Beautiful. I'm so, Mickey, I hear you now. I'm so yeah, sorry. Good. No, I, I, I was just assuming it was my fault because it always is. No, but it, it, it worked perfectly for the, uh, <laughs> yeah. for the sound. Yeah, for our little, yeah, that's what I was saying. It was okay 10 minutes ago. So. Oh, live TV, go? man. Yeah. How are you? You look good, man. You look, you look better. I, I will say that we're, <laughs> we're probably the best two looking guys right now. <laughs> on, on, on Zoom, on Zoom right on now. Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, no, I, I got to tell you, the best looking drummer I, I, I know, I think, is Steve Ferroni. Steve Ferroni pretty, could be a movie star. He's, but he's anyway, got some good looks. Yeah. T Bone always <laughs> used to say that about him. Is that right? My friend T Bone, yeah. Steve Ferroni's the best looking guy in the music biz. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know who claims that he is is Anton. When Anton, Anton Fig and I used to go out on clinic <laughs> tours, he had this great opening line. He'd say, "You know," in that South African accent, he said, yeah. "You know, I didn't get the gig on the Letterman show because I have the most chops, or because I can play the fastest, <laughs> yeah. or because he said, nope, I got the gig because I'm the best looking." <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say it like Arnold yeah. Schwarzenegger. No, he just wears a beret better than anybody else. That's right. That's his thing, man. Anton's great. Yeah, I remember doing that show a couple times. And um, the first time I did Letterman, I had to play Anton's kit. We went on and they, you know, uh, it was with Brian and he insisted, you know, that he used the band, that he used his band, you know. Yeah. And Anton was really nice and sweet. And uh, we, we got on there and we played and um, we finished the song and we were supposed to, they were supposed to go to a commercial and nobody told me that I was supposed to play into the commercial, whatever song Paul was counting off. Right. So they start playing and I'm looking around like I, <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. And Paul Shaver's going play, <laughs> Hey, play. And I, uh, Oh, so it was some shuffly weird thing that I had to jump into. And I, I just felt like an idiot. And Anton of course, never forgave me. He, he never lived made me, uh, you know, laugh about it forever. So he's, he's, he's a great player, man. He's so good. And he sure yeah, is. Yeah. 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 He's great. fantastic. And a really good guy, really yeah. fun. So anyway, uh, so things are good with you. You things look are good. good with me. Yeah. I, I think when I last spoke with you, we were talking about, um, it was a couple of weeks ago and had you got your shot, you and Susan got your shot. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. We went, um, three weeks ago now. Yeah. Uh, okay. it's almost, it's just over three weeks. It was on a Tuesday. Yeah. We lucked into it. Um, Susan got online, you know, when they said our age group here in Connecticut was available, you know, was, uh, eligible for the shot. She got online and, you know, it was of course everything, nothing, nothing available, nothing available. And then the next day she got on again and there were two spots together, 11, 15 and 11 30 at this place, uh, half an hour away. So great. And it was like a week after the appointment. So we, you know, we made the appointment. So we went, we drove over. I thought it was going to be a mess. You know, I think everything's going to be as, as bad as it can possibly. I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the motor vehicle department or, or uh, a, a canceled flight at the airport, you know, 72,000 people yeah. trying to get somewhere. I really thought it was going to be a mess, but no, it was fine. We were, we got there a bit early. They brought us right in. Yeah. There might've been, you know, 20 or 30 people in the whole place. Oh, that's cool. shots, and we got the Johnson and Johnson shot. So one shot, see ya. No side effects, everything good. And you, are you? I, I got mine last week, and it, it's it's interesting. Um, I became eligible, I think, the Friday, like two weeks ago, basically. And my daughter-in-law, who used to work for the state, has all these. I hope she doesn't mind me telling everybody that she has a lot of connections. She can pull some strings. So she actually got my appointment a day before I was technically eligible to make it, if that makes sense. Ah, right. And, and she got me an appointment at a, at a place up about 60 miles away, close to where my son and, and, and her live. 
and our grandkids. And uh, Charlie Drayton says, hi, love you too, Charlie. Oh, he's the best. Love Charlie. And, and so um, I got, I went there, Mickey, just like Ooh. you thinking the same thing. It was really well organized how they had it. Yeah. I mean, there were definitely some people there, but they had it very well organized. And I, I got there about a half hour early because I gave myself all this time to drive. You did the traffic. same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I had to go to the bathroom when I got there and I can share this with everybody. Had a lot of coffee that morning, Yeah. about an hour in the car. So I get there and I said to the guy, I'm a half hour early. Can I just use your bathroom? And he said, go ahead and they'll, they'll take you now. Just, just go in and they'll wow. take you. I went in and I got the Johnson and Johnson. Yeah. Great. And yeah. Within 10 minutes, I was processed, shot Yeah. in, in my waiting 15 minute waiting yeah. room. And, yeah. And done. Our, it was the same with us. We, we were, uh, our appointments were 1115 and 1130 and we were there at about 10 of 11. We were out of there on our way home by 20 after or something. It was just fantastic. They just get you through and yeah, let's hope it goes that well for everybody. You know, uh, yeah. I, I, most of the people around us are getting the two shots, you know, either the Moderna or the Pfizer shots. Yeah. So most of them have gotten their first shot and are either on their second one or waiting on the second one. So hopefully everybody just does it. We can all get, back to you know coughing on each other <laughs> don't worry about it as i said the other day, i'm not talking about the drum world you know we yeah exactly i'm not, we, I'm not talking about people in general i'm talking about drummers we, yeah we, tend to, we I, tend to cough and spit on each other a lot i don't know why but that happens you know. i know i was saying last night in a, in a zoom uh meeting that we a bunch of drummers had i said I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back to when we don't have to wash our hands anymore like yeah you, you know, <laughs> that's right come out of the bathroom yeah yeah there you go exactly right oh. but you know just the idea of going into a bathroom and coming out of a, a bathroom somewhere other than your own home you know it's so strange to me right now just going yeah. anywhere and doing anything so but you know we'll get there but you, and you've and you were telling me when we spoke on the phone a couple of weeks ago how I, I know it's been great because you you travel so much. I mean, you, yeah. you're on the road so much. How great it's been to be home. But you guys, you and Susan were pretty, you guys kind of had your own little bubble, right? You were kind of yeah in your own little lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, you know, we're out in the woods here. It's great. We've got lots of, the wildlife is fantastic. So, you know, I, I've always loved that. And um, we're pretty uh, private, secluded here, which is nice. Yeah. But, you know, you miss your family, you miss nieces and nephews and seeing the kids and, you know, yeah. playing and running and rolling around. But, yeah, we've been lucky. You know, we just, uh, you know, you order your groceries online, you go pick them up or you have them delivered, whatever. And uh, you stay out of places, you stay away from people and just till this thing, you know, calms down. So everybody's right. got to wear a mask and keep clean. And yeah. Yeah, you know, but we're we're lucky. We we've been uh, we've been pretty uh, fortunate to get through it with minimal, you know, damage. <laughs> Whatever. So that's great. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. I think that makes all the difference. Same with us too. Really yeah. minimal exposure and and always outside with a mask. I go running and I I have it. Oh yeah. And I I I don't run it run with it on the whole time. But if I if I'm anywhere near anybody, I put it on and just yeah. We do the same. We, we go for walks around, you know, it's beautiful up here through the woods. You know, there are some little back roads we take and we walk around and every now and then there's somebody else walking or out. So, you know, you just keep your mask up. Yeah. You know, put it yeah. on and be kind and yeah. you know, yep. be responsible for that. So, exactly. Uh, you know, you can only do what you can do. So, yeah, that's that's what we got going on. That's great, man. And, and, um, and, there's, and there's no, and we'll, we'll talk about touring and all that stuff we'll get yeah. to that I, I i wanted to just sort of be somewhat chronological and, and um as we said earlier you know i had jerry on the other day yeah uh, two days ago it feels like it was just five minutes ago because i just well, finished listening to him yeah because well also with jerry you know it's it's like he's constantly he's just beating you over the head with a with a wiffle ball bat you know with, with his <laughs> and with, with, <laughs> i can't you know and of course it's one of those things you love it you can't get enough of i know I, mean, I could listen to jerry for, for days he's the best besides the way he plays but anyway yeah yeah i get that with him so i, I understand yeah no it's great and, and i see dean kasparian um, ah. yeah do you know dean i, I know who he is yeah, yeah. dean um, had a cool little zoom uh that was what i was telling you about with jerry and, yeah. and all these other drummers last night and he was nice enough to invite me to be part of it. I'm sorry I couldn't stay longer. 
we wanted to watch some TV, but um, very important, you know, watching TV. <laughs> well, if you were watching the Aretha docu docu series there, whatever that's called, drama docu drama, have you seen that? I haven't seen that yet. Uh, is it great? Yeah, yeah, the music is fantastic. Raphael Sadiq, I guess, is yeah. responsible. And, okay. Yeah. Which, anyway, so. No, no, but Jerry was there last night too. Yeah. It was just kind of funny to just like see him again after just <laughs> spending the whole day with him the day yeah. before. <laughs> I love him. I know. I, I love him to death. I mean, he's, he's absolutely the best. Yeah. And he, you know, nobody plays that good. Nobody's well, that you, good. You play pretty damn good, my no, friend. Oh, Jerry Barada mm. is, uh, you have no idea the influence he's had on, on me and what I wow. try to do just from those early Paul and Oates sessions, you know. He was the guy, you know. Well, he to, spoke very highly of you as well. well I have, I, you know, you got to channel that guy, and uh, it's really hard to do when he's that good, you know. So, it's a, it was a pretty high bar for me <laughs> <laughs> coming in there. You know, I'd listen, I'd be able to listen to his tracks, yeah. You know that he had done early, pre, earlier, and uh, I got to watch him play the first day I went down to record. He was finishing up one of the songs and. It's like, uh oh, you know, I've got to come in here tomorrow and try to. <laughs> I was a, I was a mess. Oh man, yeah. well, but he, he's something else. He, he is, and I, I mean, I, I first became aware of you from Hollow Notes because, yeah, you know, I, I and I, as, as I said earlier too, I didn't realize you guys were both on Private Eyes. I thought, I don't, I thought Jerry had left before that, and that was really. Yeah, you. But I guess it was both you guys. But yeah, it was it was like the birth of MTV, as I'm sure you well remember. Right. Yeah. And and you were Mickey. I mean, you guys did not only a ton of videos, but some of the coolest videos. Yeah. You know, at that time, and that it was like you were everywhere, mm. all at once. Uh, yeah. I just uh, you know I fell into that gig. I I uh, I just happened to be working. Uh, I was in. Um, Electric Lady was the second session I had ever done in New York. It was at Electric Lady, which is fantastic. The first was with G.E. Smith at the power station a few months earlier. Yeah. So my first two recording experiences in New York City were the power station and Electric Lady, which, wow. Really, so how lucky was I to do that? But I, I did a record uh, with a band called Tom Dickey and the Desires. And um, Tommy Mottola was their manager who was also Hall and Oates' manager. So he came down to the sessions, he was hanging out, and he asked me if I wanted to do some tracks with Daryl and John. They were gonna be recording in a week or two, you know, just leave your kit here, just leave everything set up, and you come in next week and put some drums on it. So that was that. And, uh, yeah. you know, I got to see Jerry play and, uh, um, you know, hear some of the things he had done. Of course, he was on a couple of records before that. So, uh, you know, it was all happening really quick um, at the time. And I worked with Adams a week later. Mm. Um, Clear Mountain called me during the Private Eyes tracking day. Uh, we were actually doing the song Private Eyes. Clear Mountain called me at the studio and said he had some uh, demos from this Canadian guy and he'd love it if I played drums on it. Because Clear Mountain had done GE's record. That's where I met him and I see. Yep. Yeah. So that was the connection there. So it all sort of happened all in the same. It was actually 40 years ago this month. Okay. I uh, knew it was March. 81. Yeah. yeah. Wow. March, March of 81. It all happened the end of February into March. It was pretty unbelievable. And then, you know, I went on the road with GE that summer to promote his record. And uh, Daryl had asked me during the sessions if I'd be interested in going on the road. So I sort of joined the band in September for the first uh, the privatized tour and it just went on from there, you know, and yeah. I, you know, I got to work with Brian in between touring and sessions and I got to go to Vancouver and do more stuff with him. It just happened to work out with the timing for his records, you know, the recording. Yeah. So it was really, you know, uh, I really had nothing to do with it other than, <laughs> you know, I'm the lucky, I'm the chosen lucky one, you know, well, I think you had a little to do with it. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just for, for the timing thing, I, I, I didn't have to worry about, you know, rescheduling or, oh, gee, I can't make it. Or, you know, it all just worked out for those two sort of big acts, you know. It's amazing. And, and when you got the call, and by the way, Don McCauley is, is, uh, is watching. Mm. And he's, I don't know if you know Don, he's Charlie Watts' drum tech. Oh, um, great. Yeah, a, a super swell guy. He, he 
he wasn't when you guys played with the stones i think yeah. Chooch was still there but all oh, um, right the late great Chooch. but but don's yeah. just saying the ever solid rhythm section of our friend t-bone and mickey was unparalleled uh, t-bone was the guy i just happened to be i was lucky enough to be the guy that got to play with him on all that stuff but he he was the guy it was all him wow. i i didn't no, I mean, you know, we didn't need click tracks. We didn't need anything with T-Bone. Just, you just play to him. Yeah. Whatever he was doing, do. And, and it worked out. You know, he, he was really, people, you know, people throw the word genius around a lot, right? and especially in the music biz. But he truly was just yeah. a genius when it came to uh, arrangements and feels and uh, just what notes to put where, you know, how to get it across. He was an unbelievably great talent so super super yeah, solid yeah. yeah yeah i and i want to come back to that the yeah. click track but that you yeah. mentioned but i was going to say so when you did that first with the first record you did with brian yeah you did that in vancouver so you got the call no we it. did the, the first call the first record I did with brian was at power station it was oh perfect. yeah yeah okay. uh you want it you got it record yeah okay that was the first thing i worked on with him and it was in um, new york. great it was in new york and then um i think it was uh I think the next record was Cuts Like a Knife record, maybe. That sounds that, right. That we went to Vancouver and did a lot. But we were we were always between the power station in New York and Little Mountain up in Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were recording both of those studios. So we'd spend a week in New York, and then, you know, three weeks later, I'd fly up to uh, uh, Vancouver and work at Little Mountain, which was a fantastic studio as well. Yeah. And a yeah. great room, this beautiful, big, giant warehouse. The drum sounds were just killer. Unbelievable know. drum sounds. Yeah, and Clear Mountain yeah. loved that. You know, he he really knew how to make use of that big, big room. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Bob Rock was working up there at the t as well at the time. And uh, between those two guys, man, the, the Little Mountain sound was really something else. It was really great. Was there a house kit that you played on, Mickey, or did you bring uh, your own drums in? Yeah, uh, New York. I used my own kits, um, so I was. Um, I was playing Ludwig. I had a Ludwig kit at the time, uh, which was really great. I loved that drum kit. And, um, you know, I had a Black Beauty and then I had a big uh, eight inch metal. It was an eight inch maple shell with a chrome wrap. So the thing weighed about 80 pounds. Yeah. You know, but it had that great sound. It was really nice. So I used that on some of those early Brian tracks. But Clear Mountain always liked the Black Beauty. So mm -hmm. we used that a lot. And then in Vancouver, um, Ray Ayotte at uh, Drums, I think his place was called Drums Only. Yeah, yeah. And Ray took care of me, man. He was great. He, he always made sure I had lots of stuff, uh, whatever I needed, you know, for recording. So we used some Ludwig stuff. I used some Ayotte drums. He had his own drum kits. And, yeah, beautiful um, drums. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Yamaha thing kicked in in 82, so I always had... Yamaha gear from then on, you know, when I needed it. So the yeah. first, the early Adams record, uh, the first one I think was the Ludwig kit. And then after that, the cuts like a knife stuff was mostly my Yamaha recording custom stuff. Yeah. 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 And I, and I remember that again, MTV and the, the effect that had, you know, like, but you, you were, I, I have to, like, la I laugh when I think of MTV. Yeah, but it like so red, red Yamahas, I think, right. Am I? Yeah. Oh yeah, I had a, I had a, for every video I had a different kit, and for every tour, <laughs> you know, we were touring all the time, so it was a big thing. You know, we had these. Daryl always had these themes for the tours, like these color schemes, and you know, weird, uh, very artsy sort of yeah. approach to tour. You know, what what the stage looked like. So every tour, you know, uh, poor Hoggy, <laughs> I had Hoggy <laughs> just jumping through hoops to get me something that could sort of match up, you know, with the with the the look of the stage so the red kit yeah. i used for a little while because it was that hot red you know yamaha was making that amazing it was almost yeah. orange it was that bright red and uh i used that on a few things but yeah the videos were just we just threw in whatever the video director would want you know for yeah and they always liked that really colorful everything was really colorful right right like that right. mid mid early mid 80s thing so yeah. uh, yeah. a lot of a lot of plastic so anyway, and then I was using, you know, I was also using the um, um, Simmons pads on a lot of those kind of. Oh, weird. yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, you had, 
<laughs> whatever it was happening at the time, you sort of jumped on that, you know? So That's right. Pads were a big part of them. I yeah. forgot that because, you know, I was working for Simmons in 85. I hadn't met you at the time, but right. Pete, Pete Moshe. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. He was the guy that we used to deal with. Yeah. He was your, he was your like electronics. Yeah. He was the guy. Go-to guy. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. We were, we were using Simmons pads way early and we had my regular kit uh, for, for tour, you know, for live and next to the hats, you know, where, um, you know, most guys have a little, maybe a second snare drum or yeah. um, I, I had a big Simmons rig. <laughs> <laughs> set up. and i just there were a couple of songs you know i would just whack away at the seven kids we had a couple songs uh that were big hits for them that just had little sort of that rolling 808 little drum box rhythm yeah. box thing yeah. or whatever it was called uh i can't go so for I that would, or something yeah like those that. kinds yeah. of things so i would just play the simmons kit i would play the parts we tweak the sounds for the simmons kit oh, okay. to sound like that yeah i kind of play along with goofy silly stuff <laughs> No man. It was... Matter of fact, all that stuff I I found it about a year year and a half ago out in my I have a barn full of cases of stuff just you know over the years and I found all those Simmons pads and a friend of mine over here in uh, in Connecticut he's one of these um, he loves all that old electronics stuff you know oh man look you got all that Simmons stuff so I just gave him all the stuff to and he fixed it all he repaired it all and got it all tweaked. And, He's got them over in his studio over there now. So my Lynn machines, he's had a couple of those there. And yeah, just all the stuff we used on those early records. You know? really well, hold on to it, Mickey. Cause you know, I mean, that stuff is people yeah. will pay big money for vintage. Yeah. SDS I just, I just think it's cool that, you know, it's, it's part of, uh, it's part of our history, you know, where the where all those sounds came from, man. And yeah. Yeah. Very timely. You can really tell what was recorded in 1983, you know, yeah, absolutely. To that stuff. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> that's that's cool. Yeah. Um, John Ferraro is asking about your symbols um, yeah. back at that time. I'm guessing mostly A Zildjian's probably yeah. back at that time. All A Zildjian's. All A Zildjian's. All of them. Yeah. I use, I've, I've always used 15 inch new beat hi hats because yeah. I love them. They just, for me, they just work for me, you know. Uh, they get that great Ringo wash if you need yeah. it. Yep. And um, they can really, be nice and tight and crisp and clean if you need them as well. Um, I've just always loved 15s. I have used 14s. You know, sometimes, you know, you're in the studio, you use what's there. But um, for me, it's always been those 15-inch new beats. And I always had uh, A's. And I like the A Customs. Uh, I've got a couple of K Darks that I like, smaller crash symbols. They, you know, they have a nice sort of... Uh, you don't really hear the attack of the stick. Yeah. The symbol just sort of opens up. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. And I've always had a rivets of some kind. It's always been, you know, every great, every great uh, rock drummer, all of your heroes, every yeah. single one of them from 1963 to 1973, maybe had a rivets symbol. Oh, That's right. And rivets in their ride symbols or rivet, just rivet symbol. And I always love that sound. It's like, why is, how does that symbol, the decay of that symbol last as long as it does, you know? Yes. Compression's a big part of it when you're recording, but there's something about just how that symbol just rides by itself. It's fantastic, man. It's, um, you know, I think about, um, I know Miles what you're going to say the Miles Davis. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're thinking of Hal Blaine because yes. that's the other, yeah. Yeah. There are two, there are two great for me. Like I still get goosebumps when I hear them. Uh, Hal Blaine at the uh, downbeat of um, Never My Love, the association song. He's playing uh, brushes, but he hits that rivet cymbal when he comes oh. in. And it's just, it's the warmest, most beautiful sound. And it's so good for the song. You know, yeah, he was a master at that, just playing the song. You know? And the other one is um, uh, Jimmy Cobb. Uh, I think it's on So What. Um, yeah, he comes in with the rivets. And mm -hmm. like the first, I think it's the first sax solo or something. It's like, it's just, yeah, ugh, tears your heart out, man. It's I, so I, good. I totally, like I just, 
Yeah. You, you just jump up. You know? Yeah. Yep. You, you can't help it. It's so exciting and so good. But I've always been a, a big fan of rivet symbols, so I try to sneak one. A lot of guys don't like it when you, you know, when you go over there. It's too much noise, or it's too washy, or it's too whatever. But I always try to sneak one in. That's cool. That's I, really I always cool. keep one over, sort of. It's way down, past my second floor, Tom. You know, it's mm -hmm. the last symbol over there. So if you get lost down there, you know, you got something. Because I get lost down there a lot. You, you got somewhere to go. <laughs> Is it, right. is it, a, yeah, this, is it a this will finish, thing? this will finish it up. Yeah. Here you go. And you know, you can whack away. Yeah. You just whack away at the thing and it covers a lot of uh, mistakes. Thank oh, you. that's funny. Come on. Yeah, well, it's what it is, man. <laughs> and, and so when you, going back to your, like your early days as a drummer, I'm guessing you had Ringo must've been an influencer. Of at course. Some, yeah, yeah. Some level. Yeah. I saw the Beatles when I was seven years old. I was living at my grandmother's house and wow. She wasn't going to let us watch. I was, I was little. She wasn't going to let us watch these. I don't you know these long haired, whatever. <laughs> on Ed's own. But I happened to be able to, the, the crack in the doorway between the, in the living room. And, um, we all lined up. All my brothers and I were like lined up. They looked like a cartoon, you know, the cartoon mice when they climb yeah. on each other's back and look through the, look through the keyhole. Yeah. It was kind of like, it was like that. Totally. Yeah. So we're watching and that man, I just, I don't know what hit me, but it hit me like crazy. It was just, wow, life-changing, right? The Beatles, yeah. man. And Ringo was so just incredible to watch. The energy and the, just his his hands and his his all of his, his move, just he was fantastic. Yeah. So I was hooked. I thought, wow, that's great. So, you know, a couple of years later, I was taking lessons at school and, uh, you know, started playing we got a yeah. drum kit and uh the rest as they say you know but yeah ringo was a huge influence yeah um, and um you know i i you gotta you know if you're a drummer today you're over, and if you're over i don't know 30 or 40 years old whatever and you know you don't say ringo is an influence you're lying because yeah he changed the game for everybody you know he he really brought the especially pop rock song style drumming and just yeah. nobody else did that. Could do, could even come close. Yeah. He just changed it all. He changed the whole game, you know, and even later, the, the later records where they were really sort of getting artsy and working on sort of effects and sounds and just untouchable, man. He totally was, agree. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. the guy. He's yeah. the guy. And, and I, you know, and I, I, I'm a couple of years younger than you, so I didn't get to see them live. So what? That would make you what? 110. 110. <laughs> <laughs> don't you? No, you don't feel like that. I feel like that. Uh, no, come on. Let's talk about the old days. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wore my old school shirt today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome for that, right? Yeah. No, for, for oh, me. you are? Yeah, that's good, man. But, no, but I, I, I couldn't agree more about Ringo, yeah. just like the... And the, the influence that he had, you know, well after 1964, well after. Absolutely. Like, like you said, all those later years. <clears throat> yeah. And whether people realized it or not, it's like he was influencing a generation that influenced an, another generation. Absolutely. And, yeah. You know, he changed, he changed it and, you know, for the better. And uh, he created this whole new approach, sound, feel, you know, all the stuff we live for, you know, we, yeah. we that we strive for when we're working or uh, recording or whatever, you know, you, you want to have that kind of uh, input on a song, you know, and he, yeah. he, he just did the, he did it. He did it, you yeah. know, and a million guys after him just, you know, started doing it and here we are, you know? Right. So, yeah. Yeah. But there were a lot of guys in the sixties, you know, you listen to the radio, how Blaine was, you know, come on. You listen to the anything in the '60s. You turn your radio on. Hal Blaine was playing on everything. I know he was on everything. Everything. Yeah. And and, um, and I was just going to say, you know, and and as a kid, I was influenced by all those songs, AM radio, and then yeah, and then I I don't know about you, Mickey, but years later, I when I got older, I sort of like 
re-fell in love with them. I never stopped loving them, but yeah. I guess when like when they started the classic rock or oldies formats on on FM and all those like uh mamas and the papas songs and yeah. you know carpenters and yeah all those Beach great Boys. yeah those great LA records you know yeah. how's the guy and um guy. through all of that you know there there are a million angles you know you have, you've got the Motown thing you had the Memphis guys you had the Muscle Shoals guys you had the uh you know Detroit and Chicago and uh, the Philly the guys in Philly what they were doing you know yeah it, just crazy the pockets of amazing stuff and it was all on the radio uh, for me, you know, I was probably 13 or 14, um, FM radio kicked in and, uh, I had a little clock radio that I would just leave on a uh, local WPLR in New Haven. You know, they played just, it was mm -hmm. a, that great rock, but they would play whole albums. Yeah. Yeah. Was, here's a new one, by the, here's a new one from the doors and they just play the whole record. You know, here's Zeppelin's new record and they play the whole thing. So I used to just keep that on near my head at night, you know, in my bunk bed, <laughs> with all my brothers <laughs> trying to sleep around me, and I keep it on really low, you know, and um, those, those were the things that just got you going, you know, yeah, up yeah. the next day, and you didn't want to go buy the record and practice, you know, put it on and play to it. Yeah, all that stuff. What, a, what a great, I know, what a great time to be coming up as a, as a young, we're really lucky. We were lucky, you know, I, uh, to, to have all that great music, you know, sixties and seventies, um, yeah. there was great, great stuff going on, really creative. And, uh, you know, there's one guy, um, who not many guys talk about, but he's a huge influence. Um, Buddy Saltzman who played on all of the Frankie Valley. Four yeah. Seasons. Okay. Yeah. Really, <clears throat> he's drumming on those tracks just unbelievably great yeah you know yep. a lot of people try to sort of copy that stomp thing that they had and just you know with the hand claps you know the four on the floor hand clap thing yeah uh, but buddy Salsman, man you know he was all over those songs were all over the radio too and uh just one of those great players you know it's funny, yeah, and and, yeah. and I, I wouldn't have known his name, but yeah, um, but you're right. There's so many guys like that 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 weren't Hal Blaine that were actually, you know, session guys session. doing doing yeah. other stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's. Um, but I just thought I'd throw his name out there because I, you know, he was a big influence on me. And, that's uh, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, there's a, a question, Mickey. I'm going to just before I, it, it scrolls away here on Facebook from John Rogers, asking um, if you could maybe just asking me to ask you about your bass drum technique on Brian Adams, uh, heart of the night, incredibly difficult to master. Uh, and then he's talking about adult education, Hall and Oates, yeah. Firewoman, whole bunch of songs. Um, and yes, I, and, and I was going to sort of get into some of that stuff and maybe, yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. The heat of the night track, the heat of the night track was um, Brian had sort of a, a or G, I think it was, you know, Brian wrote all those songs with Jim Valance uh, and Jim's an unbelievably great drummer. Jim worked with Tom Jones and, you know, played on great. He was just a great drummer up in Canada. And um, Jim wrote all those songs with Brian. And he had a lot of the songs had demos where either Jim was playing or he'd program a little something just to, you know, get, get the song uh, rolling. Uh, Heat of the Night was one of those. It had a, um, like a Lynn part. And that kick drum pattern was in there. Ah. Is yeah. that little triplety thing, boom, 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 you know, boom, 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 and I thought, oh man, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to play this. <laughs> so, as is my attitude most of the time before I, the, before the red light goes on, and you, it, you're just sitting there going, oh, I'm gonna screw this up. So, <laughs> um, we did, we did a run through, and I didn't play the pattern. I played really simple, and then I think Clear Mountain or Brian or somebody said, "Yeah, that's it's all really good, but maybe we could try to squeeze in some of those little, you know, um, sixteen things." And I went, "Okay, I'll try." So I did a pass, and we got a lot of them in there. Yeah, and, and then Clear Mountain sort of pieced it together, pieced the track together, which is he did that a lot. We would yeah. drop fills in later, or you know. Uh, a lot of little kick drum things, you know, if I missed something here and there, we'd just go in and fix, you know. 
but he was splicing tape a lot mm. <laughs> on those <laughs> records. And uh, just for fills mostly, we, we yeah. would do a take, do two or three, whatever. You know, some of those were the first take, some of those songs. But Heat of the Night took a little work and uh, yeah, it ended up what it was. And um, most of that is because Clear Mountain knew what he was doing <laughs> and, you know, fixed me. You can you can hear that in those records too, where the the fills are so big. Yeah, and and uh, and that make I I never realized that they were overdubbed, but that makes sense. In, in, Some of them, the you know, a lot yeah. of those fills, you know, you're in the heat of the moment, right? You're just going, you're yeah. playing, and you're wailing, and everybody's wailing. And most of those tracks were live off the floor, you know, yeah. drums, bass, keys, guitar. Uh, we would just do them, just go for it, you know, and turn the click up turn the recording and just get the drums as loud as I can get them in my cans without going deaf and uh, yeah, wail away. So a lot of those fills were just what I played. And then, you know, we'd listen back and uh, Brian, he, he, Brian loves when you go over. Yeah. Give me more of those big, long, you know, big, long, do, do more of those. And he'd sing the fill. So, <laughs> you know, you go back out and you play six or eight more fills yeah. through some of those sections, then Clear Mountain would cut cut them in where they liked them. You know, yeah, that's how it worked. Cool. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that, that's, that was always fun, and it was always yeah. exciting. You know, to hear the final result of uh, that stuff. But a lot of that was just off the floor. We just played those tracks, and you know, you could patch up stuff later. Yeah. You hone in on details, and and cool that you guys did them pretty much live too that it has that yeah. kind of feel to it like a really organic yeah well a lot of that especially with brian's songs you know brian's a really good guitar player but keith scott is yeah he, uh, i've never worked with a play a good guitar player that's so intuitive and uh um just um i don't know he gets it he gets it every single time yeah there's never a um an unsure part of a song when keith's playing guitar he just goes for it yeah and uh a lot of that energy on those tracks comes from the way keith approached that you know so he's a blast to work with i i, I know you guys are tight yeah well what you know we play live and he's he's the loudest thing in my cans and uh i play to him wow you know? yeah yeah he's he's something else man it's great. I, I i've seen you guys a bunch of times and yeah. i yeah yeah and as as a guitar, as a drummer i can totally appreciate like he has he he has a great sound yeah and and just like a just a such a well-rounded musician in terms yeah. of just like yeah he's always- scary he's scary he can play anything uh you know we we at sound checks we're always doing you know uh, some cream or or hendrix or you know one of those uh, just all those sort of great rock yeah, and so he yeah. and he gets to just wail. He just wails away. Or we'll do a Who song. Well, we'll do a quarter of a Who song because I can't breathe after eight bars of trying to do Keith Moon. <laughs> I'm like I'm falling off the. I can't keep my hands up anymore. Uh, how did he? How did that guy play? Like that? Well, he was in his twenties. Yeah, well, that, but... I was in my twenties once, a hundred years ago. I, I, I couldn't do that even then. He was he was ridiculous, but anyway. So Keith Keith gets to just flaunt, and he's crazy good. He's just crazy good. He's I, I can't wait to see you guys again. I'm I'm hoping maybe next year you'll you'll who knows yeah year, but yeah yeah as your friend Steve Gad once said, we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've been, I'm getting a lot of mileage out of that. I'm, I'm oh, sorry. Good. I'll probably have to send him a check or something, but I'm getting a lot of mileage out of that one. It is. Great I, know. Line. I use it probably once a day here oh, at it's home. It's such a great line. Yeah. When my I wife can asks hear, me about I can the hear him, I can hear him <laughs> saying it, which is yeah. even better. Yeah. Speaking of, you know, all time great, legendary, phenomenal musicians, there's a guy. Yeah, he's he's pretty he's pretty special. He's wow. Pretty, yeah. And a, and a, and like yourself a very humble unassuming guy. He would tell you exactly what you said is that oh that I the reason that sounds good is cuz somebody else was there to make it sound good. Just like you're trying to the same kind of bull you're trying to. Well, pull. He's he's lying. 
I'm not. <laughs> he's a liar. Did anybody ever tell you Steve Gadd's a liar? He's he's lying Boy, to you. <laughs> I know he's a liar. <laughs> I'm an honest guy. I'm telling you the truth. So, uh, that's the difference between. There's the big difference between Steve Gadd and I. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm uh, gonna get in trouble now. Mickey, you are so beloved. I have to tell you, there's so many people watching, and so many people that were excited about this, and it's Mike Beard watching right now. Wow. Dave Maddox. I love Dave. I wanted to talk about Dave today. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, we'll talk about Dave. Yeah. We, we and we'll say I, some nice things too. Oh. <laughs> yes. John Tempesta, who's the, ah. the current drummer for the cult. Yes, of course. Yep. And we'll talk about the cult too, but I was going to, so just, just to jump back a second. Yeah. Um, doing basically doing hollow notes, huge like you when you got in the band i mean at that time yeah private eyes was really what just sort of turned the corner for them yeah basically and and all those years and you were doing that simultaneously right with brian yeah Yeah. and and but you were able to sort of the schedule somehow yeah you know we do uh we recorded private eyes i think i spent i i don't think i spent more than two maybe three days in the studio i did four or five tracks on that record and uh we took our time with the stuff and um, uh, Neil Kernan engineered that. And he's the guy who got those great drum sounds on that record. Yeah. I love the drum sounds on that record. They're just big, fat, in your face, flat, uh, really beautiful. And uh, when you get sounds like that, you know, you play that way, Yeah, right? you play to what you're hearing. So um yeah, it, I just it kept it really good. simple. Uh, you know, first of all, you're a nervous wreck. You don't want to overplay. You don't want to play the wrong thing. You just want to, you know, get through the track and then sort of uh, you can hone in, you know. So you do a take. If it feels great, you go in and you work on details. So Daryl was always just keep it simple, but keep the energy up. And, you know, um, he wanted everything kind of like a James Brown review. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, lots of energy, but you know, just nail the groove. So that's, that's sort of the approach we had, but yeah, I was lucky. And, um, it worked out where I got to work with Brian in between all of that stuff. You know? and, and you, you kind of at, at that, at that point, would you say that you were maybe more, maybe more committed to hollow notes in terms of like touring obligation? Like if there was a, yeah, yeah. If there was going to be a problem, I, you know, I was committed, I was in that band. So I had to, yeah. you know, I had to, commit to that but brian was you know really gracious about scheduling and stuff but it happened to work out it was really amazing it, it just happened to work out where you know i had that couple of weeks i needed i could go to vancouver or go back into manhattan and work with him into new york and uh you know it just the timing was was really perfect for a lot of that i think claremont had a lot to do with it as well you know his scheduling because he was doing the same thing he was working with hall and oates yeah. and he was working with brian you know so, um, uh, yeah, it just, you know, I, I don't know how it worked out the way it did, but it, it just did, you know, once again, you know, luck had a lot to do with it. Well, you, it's good, good. You got some good karma working in your favor and that, yeah, I that, think, I think that had, yeah. had something to do with it. You know, everybody just wanted to make it as good as we could. Yeah. Like both of yeah. those projects, you know, there was a session with, uh, Brian, um, uh, it was the heaven session. The song heaven uh we were at the power station yep. and i had to i had a rehearsal at sir with hall and oates that day and brian wanted to record <laughs> so i was in new york uh, uh staying and uh i talked to him and he said no it's cool uh we'll start we'll get going on the song you know you go do your rehearsal and come back and we'll record it tonight you know so okay so we we got in early that day we got in the studio and we set up and we ran through the song a couple of times and I, you know, I'm looking at my watch and buddy, I'm really sorry, man. I got to go. And yeah. Okay. No problem. Just, you know, so I'll see you later. So I went, great. I'll come back as soon as I'm done. Rehearsal's only a few hours. I'll, I'll be mm -hmm. back. So I go out, I go out, go rehearse with uh, Daryl and John and I go flying back down to power station and I walked in and they're listening back to the song and it's all done. Steve Smith is standing in the control room. <laughs> and my first reaction was, that's Steve Smith. <laughs> Whoa, 
I get to meet Steve. I get to meet Steve Smith, who at the time was absolutely like just one of my listen to the stuff this guy plays. You know, yeah. Just, yeah. You know? And so we, everybody kind of look. Everybody kind of looks at me like, uh oh, or whatever. And um, we listen to the song. It was unbelievably good. The drum track is so good on that song. Steve <laughs> plays so beautifully. He got lucky, Mickey. That's it. It was just luck. Nope. It what uh, you know, so I don't know what happened. But anyway, Brian's oh Mick, yeah, hey, listen, um, you know, Steve was in town and I was talking to him on the phone. I said, You want to come down? And he came down and we just put the track together. And I went, buddy, you got a it's fine. You got an amazing track, and you know, Steve's and Steve was so kind and sweet and nice yeah. and you know, really nice. So anyway, that that was that was the one day where those two gigs sort of clashed and crossed paths and uh, I didn't. I didn't come out the other end very well. <laughs> well, from either of them, but it was okay because the song's yeah. great and is a, a huge hit for him. And really yeah. Huge. And oh, I that, that's a that's a, a obviously the the best you know outlook to to have on it. And as you say, it's it's uh, you know it was the time you know the timing had worked out all those other times. Yeah, and, and, and you time. know it yeah. was really the only time where uh, you know I. I made a decision and, you know, I had to, I sort of screwed somebody up and I hated doing that. So, yeah. but it worked out. It worked out for everybody. It was just fine. Yeah. Um, Bill Fleming is asking if, did Steve play Mickey's drums on that track? And I believe he, the answer is yes. He yeah. did. Yes. Yes. And he played them a lot better than I would have on that <laughs> track as well. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's the same drum kit that uh, I used on all the other songs for those, that record in particular, but you know it's Steve playing it, even the sound of the toms and the snare drum. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm sure his tune. He probably tuned to, to get comfortable and sort of set him up. You know, changed his. Yeah. Uh, but it's really, it's really cool to hear someone else whack away at your. I, I mean, I know what it's like to sit at somebody else's kit. I can't. It's really hard for me. And I, I, and I think Steve has talked about. I've, I've spoken to Steve about it. Yeah. many times, and and I think. I, and I could be imagining this, Mickey, you would know better, but was Brian looking for something kind of like the faithfully journey sort of. He might've been, but I mean, you know, that's, that's Steve's thing. Yeah. When yeah, it comes to playing on, playing on, uh, you know, a four minute, three and a half minute song. Steve's yeah. approach is he's got those great ideas, man. Yeah. He comes up with the coolest sort of off the wall things. And then his choices for Phil's, are just beyond, you know, they're, they're open, they're simple, but there's so much uh, feel in what he plays. So that's his thing. That's what he sounds like. You know, a Steve Smith track when you hear one, you can't, you know, how can yeah. you not know it's him? It's, it's his, uh, you know, he's so unique in his approach. So yeah, it would probably, Brian probably said to him, yeah, give me one of those, you know, big, big rock ballad, power ballad drum tracks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, I think it's, I love playing it every night. I, you know, I get to do some of those fills. They're just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. They're ridiculous. And they're so much fun to play and uh, you know, it's great, but yeah, I think probably that's probably what happened. I don't know. I, I would bet you too. And I, I think he even, I, I feel like he said that told me that there was oh, yeah. some connection to that. And, well, you know, and Brian it, and yeah. Jim as well. And when we were recording, if Jim wasn't in the room, he was on the phone with Brian while yeah. we were tracking and Jim always had ideas and things and uh, you know, please put a Tom fill here or make sure you get the ride symbol through this part or, yeah. you know, we need a couple of crash symbols. Jim ha always had drum arrangement ideas, you know, which helped me out immensely because I'm one of those guys, you know, you go in and you just sort of wail through something, you know, you, you get an idea of what the song is and you just play and you hope that it works, you know, and, you know, you change up some of the bits and pieces and parts, but um, Jim always had great arrangement ideas. So that might've been something with Steve as well, when they were mm -hmm. tracking, uh, you know, Brian and Jim might've had some ideas about how to get Steve Smith to shine on this particular yeah. big ballad. Your, your parts are always so memorable, Mickey. I mean, I, I just like all those Brian Adams songs and, and Hollow Note songs and, you know, and again, you're, you're being way too, humble and, and modest because, and, and I, other people are agreeing with me here that it's like, you know, I mean, it's, 
I, you know, it's, I, I heard on uh, the show The Office was on either last night or the night before the episode where they kept playing Life is a Highway. Oh, <laughs> if you watch that show, the, the, yeah. Michael's like Michael Scott, you know, the main he's character. Air, air drumming. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, they're like driving in there for like a five hour drive and they just keep playing that. Playing song. Life is a Highway. Wow. <laughs> Life is a Highway. Yeah. That was fun. That yeah. Was, that was good. Joe Hardy. God bless. I, I miss, we, we all miss him. We talk about him a lot the guys who worked with him that I you know anyway. Um, yeah. Those sessions were fun. That was all done at ardent in, in Memphis. Oh, and Tom, okay. yeah. I had worked with Tom on uh, Tom Cochran on an earlier record. I did a couple of tracks for him up at mushroom in Vancouver and we, we hit it off, you know, pretty well. And he's, he's, he's another guy. He's pretty crazy and fun and, you know, yeah. he's really energetic and he's really you know positive about his, his songs and, uh, so we got in and did that. Uh, that track was done pretty quickly too. That that was pretty fast, and you can hear it. It's it's pretty. The drum track's pretty sloppy, but it's really wow. the energy. There's a lot of energy there, you know. And so much energy. Yeah. The fun part of it was Joe Hardy. Uh, we set up this little braid. I have a Brady 13 inch snare drum. We set it up as a second snare, and I cranked it as tight as I could, as tight as I could get that top head. I couldn't get it in, and. I just set it up. I wasn't planning on using it for anything or to do anything with it. And Joe said, all right, let's just check the sound on that drum. So I whacked it a couple of times and he went, I want you to hit that thing as much as you just, whenever you can get your left hand over there, I want you whacking away at that snare drum. What a sound. That what drum, an effect it has. Man, that yeah. drum just, but anyway, it's all over that track. Yeah. Know? And, uh, Joe, Joe loved it. I'm not sure. I don't know if Tom loved it, but they kept it. So <laughs> well, I, guess, the, I guess it worked out. The break in the middle, you know, the sort of breakdown section yeah. where it's just you. And <laughs> man, it's just so yeah. freaking great. And I think and, they worked on that kick drum too. They, they really um, sort of honed in on that. And it's so, when I hear that song, the kick drum is so big and loud. Yeah. Uh, and monotonous, you know. <laughs> it, it makes me a little nuts because Joe Joe really wanted to uh, get that drum mix right, you know. But that was that was fun. That whole record was fun. Spider Seneve is the bass player on that record, and we had a blast. That's a great. Spider, record, Spider works yeah. with Rubber Boy now. He's he's been with them for a long time. But oh, okay, he's a yeah. great bass player and the sweetest guy. We 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 had a blast playing those tracks, you know. And Tom, it was just the three of us. Tom just banged away on his guitar, was strumming away. And Spider sort of sat next to me and Joe Hardy just kept everybody laughing. And uh, another guy, man, who just knew what he was doing in a control yeah, room, you yeah. know, really knew how to get it. So that was fun, that record. That, yeah, I, I just, it, it, it's been in my head. I, I think it was last night or the night before that episode was on and yeah. just, yeah. And that I, song I is so great. It's really catchy. Like the, the, yeah. the little turnaround riff on the guitar, you know, it just keeps sort of circling yeah. around. Yeah. But, uh, dun, 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 it's so great it's really really catchy you know and it gets a bit hypnotic so um that was fun to do i love hearing it you hear it every once in a while it's great yeah and i'm i'm, I'm really glad for tom that it went as big as it did it's everywhere it's everywhere all over the place yeah yeah so it's great. And jimmy keegan i don't know if you know jimmy great drummer somebody the phil and i and i was going to talk about that too um we're, i know we're jumping around but yeah um yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, blah, boom, boom, blah, blah. Oh. <laughs> or, or I probably butchered it, but. I, it, no, I butchered it. You, <laughs> no, you, sang, no, it, you sang it perfectly. No, I I, anybody's doing any butchering around here, buddy, it's going to be me. No, but you know, all your, not all your fills, but so many of your fills are like we drummers. It's like, you know what I mean? I, I <laughs> yeah, walk the, around the house. The like, air drummer you know, guy, I know. You know you're doing one tom and another tom and the snare and the flams and the blah. Mm -hmm. yeah a lot of that stuff uh you know clear mountain always got that great big giant room drum sound and you know we i would if i flammed it, the drums would explode you know just on that yeah. and i always flammed on the hoops right so you catch a little bit of the rim you get the the, the, head, the head and yeah. then and then clear mountain had that thing where he he mic'd the top and bottom of all the drums and then he would sort of send the sound out there. He, I remember yeah. him setting up giant speakers in the, in the uh, parking garage at power station. 
and then putting microphones at the other end of the garage and then gating the. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd listen back. I do a flam on, I had a 16 and 18 floor toms for those records and you do a flam on the floor toms and the speakers would just rip. Yeah. And, And he loved it. You know, he got it so gigantic, these drum sounds. So the, the more open you did things, the bigger, the sound and the more effect yeah. the, the yep. drums would have. I mean, you tried to play quick or fast right. on those fills, you'd lose a lot of the effect, you know, it would just sort of yeah. sound like, you know, um, it would sound like me trying to play a fast fill. So a lot of the big open things just uh, came from uh, me playing and thinking, uh, keep it open, um, the, let the drum sing. You know, let the, yeah. let the let the decay of the sound take its its own maximum feel. And so, when you were when you were playing those tracks live, Mickey, were you were you hearing that in your cans? Did, was the mix that? Yeah. Like, well, were you getting some of that effect in your? Well, the early days we didn't have cans. You know, it just had, I had a a couple of wedges and a big big bass speaker behind me. Yeah. And I would wear little. I had these little earplugs made to cut out any, because, you know, a snare drum is like a gun going off. Yeah. You know, your hearing can, and cymbals are just, so uh, the early days, you know, especially the Hall and Oates stuff and some of the early Brian touring, I went with him in 87 to tour, but um, we're all just speakers around me. Uh, Once I got in ears, man. Yeah. Yeah. That was heaven for me. It's like being in a recording studio, you can just get any, kind of mix you need and really fan. and we have a great uh rob neville is our our monitor guy he's fantastic he, he's a drummer as well he's a really good drummer and so he knows how to get a drum mix in my cans and you know he he hones in on that stuff so he's great that's great yeah but um yeah i like hearing i like hearing things the way uh you know you want to play the way you want people to hear you yeah yeah right so uh having a good mix and being able to do those open fills with that live, you know, playing live, but you play in these, some of these gigantic buildings, it's almost impossible mm. to get uh, what you need uh, for sound. And to, you know, most of the stuff you're playing isn't getting out there. A lot of the inside stuff, the smaller notes, and it's just not getting out there. You know, you yeah. gotta, so the, you know, the, if you're going to have all big notes, uh, you know, spread them out and make them, open enough so you know yeah. it makes sense yeah but that's, a, that's... a lot of that stuff um was that you know just letting letting the thing speak for itself and try to do something fun you know i mean so memorable and 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 so when you were recording some of those tunes yeah were you getting were you getting like were you able to hear close to what the final sound was going yeah. To be or, yeah yeah clear mountain uh, bob clear mountain is one of those guys um yeah you're you're hearing a really amazing mix in your cans when you're yeah, recording. Yeah. Right. Uh, he's he's so good at getting the the mix in the cans, you know, to sound like a final sort of mix. He's so that, really good at it. So yeah, those drums, the drums you're hearing on those records, pretty much sounded like that when we recorded them. You know, that's cool. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of. Um, he didn't uh, play with that stuff a lot after. And I'm 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 guessing that had to have um, in a positive way influenced the way you played too. Like it, Absolutely. When you're sounding that good. It's just, like, I've always said it, you know, yeah. Bob Clearmountain gave me, you know, he's responsible for a lot of just me working and, you know, getting out there and getting gigs and uh, Clearmountain did that. You know, I just played, he made it sound like that, you know? Yeah. So uh, I owe Bob a lot, you know, and Bob rock as well does the same thing. He's, he's just got great ears, you know, Neil Kernan was like that with the Hall and Oates records. He just got great. Those records sounded like that when they were recorded. Yeah. You know, you get a good, good drum mix and uh, you go from there and you play to that, you know, you play to the sound. Uh, yeah. That's for me, you know, if I have a shitty headphone mix, I'm, you know, I, it, you're you're not getting the thing. You're not you know you're not sort of inspired enough, or you're not getting you don't you know you play to the sound. I don't know any other way to explain it, but um, I totally get it. Yeah, yeah and- a good drum sound uh, is essential to getting a good uh, performance. You know. Yeah, 
I, and at a much lower level that I'm at, I can totally relate to what you're saying. Though, even when we play a room where just the acoustics of the room, the drums sound like shit, you're just yeah. kind of not grooving. And then the next night, you happen to be in a place with the ceilings maybe a little higher, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's like, oh yeah, man, I, I yeah. sound like Mickey Curry tonight. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's no, I'm it, and it just it, uh oh, it, no, no, I'm I'm serious too. It really makes you feel better and play better. And yeah, and well, you know, too, um, I played in a lot of bars and clubs and you know, weddings and bar mitzvahs and a lot of little shitholes. And you know, I played everywhere. And I think if you do that long enough, you sort of know how to adapt what you're in the where you are the room you're in what your kit sounds like to you and you know you adapt your playing so that probably helps a lot i mean it's a great training ground you know playing yeah. five sets a night every night for five or six years you know um so that that probably has something to do with uh you know how you play to what you're hearing you know? yeah yeah mm. Well, I, another question I was going to ask you, we've sort of talked, we sort of touched on a little bit, but I, I was curious to know if talking about those years where you were, you were so busy and so active between Hall and Oates and, and Brian, and that was really through the eighties, right? I mean, it was, you were with Hall and Oates until yeah. the late 80s, 86, 86. Yeah. Did you find that you, did you have to adjust your approach from one, like when you'd go to rec, like, rec, I mean, I know there were a lot of similarities and same producers or engineers sometimes, but yeah. was your, did you have to kind of consciously go with Brian? I'm going to go for a, more of a feel like this. And, and yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, Daryl and John, uh, it's that sort of R and B, everything was very sort of soul R and B related. Yeah. And yeah. for me, that's my sort of comfort zone, you know, just groove, right. Yeah. Just, yeah keeping time and getting a good groove and sort of a lot of sort of insinuated sort of 16th note things, you know, just that, um, that was always my favorite, uh, way to play with Brian. It was, you know, rock, you had to big open rock, hit the snare drum as hard as you can get a big giant backbeat. And, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely more sort of big rock, yeah, he you know he goes for that. He he wants it to really rock when you're playing with him, you know. So uh, yeah, there was definitely a, a different uh, approach. But I love I love playing different yeah things. You know, uh, when I was in uh, the Scratch Band in Connecticut, I was in a band called the Scratch Band in Connecticut uh, before I started going into New York and working, and we played everything and reggae. Uh, I learned how to play reggae stuff by just doing it and doing it and doing it with um, the band. We were big Bob Marley fans and Toots and the Maytals. And, um, you know, so the reggae thing became uh, really a, a big part of sort of how I did it. Latin music, uh, just all those rhythms, you know, you learn this stuff and you practice it. And you, but I always, the, my point is I love playing different things, you know, yeah. so, it was great to be able to do that with Daryl and John play the sort of all of your favorite, you know, New Orleans Motown, um, you know, that stuff. And uh, I used to love the Motown covers, not to interrupt you, but I, yeah. I loved, um, you know, all that, that was, I just will say you guys did it yeah. so authentically, you know, well, Daryl's that guy, man. Yeah. Daryl is a, is a soul singer and he's such a great singer and he's really incredibly gifted when it comes to he he can sit at the piano and come up with stuff most of those records he was writing with john they'd sit at you know john would stand there with his guitar and daryl would sit at the piano and they wrote all those songs sort of while we were working you know they had ideas they'd bring them in yeah man eater i remember was written right pretty much in the room would the day we recorded it and wow. you know, that Daryl was just, he's incredible. He can, he's one of those guys in a half an hour, he'll have 10 songs or ideas for songs. Yeah. Yeah. Just by sitting at the piano and, and doodling, you know, and he sings, he's got that voice. It's uncanny how good yeah. a singer he is, uh, you know, and John as well. John had all these amazing ideas for stuff. Daryl would start something and John, you know, he's 
doodling, whittling on his guitar, just little whittly, little whittly things, great little parts and uh, vocal things, you know, they come up with, it's just incredible to watch. So it must have been, it must because, because you guys were so productive during that time. And it was like, like every album after album, hit yeah. after hit for like yeah. years, you know? Well, that, that era too, you know, it was very um, sort of artist oriented, you know, they, they were encouraged to to come up with a million songs and let's get this out there and let's and Tommy Mottola worked really hard at yeah. making sure that these guys uh, had good solid hit records you know yeah. uh, make sure this it, a lot of songs didn't make it because Tommy didn't think they were single worthy right so a lot of those records had you know nothing but hit singles on them and um, a couple mm -hmm. of album tracks you know here and there. But um, yeah, it was quite a time for, um, you know, artistic sort of, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, I was gonna, it, yeah. it was that era, as you say, of, of when, when, you know, you had managers or, or record label executives, you know, you talk to the guys like in Bill Gibson from Huey Lewis. And yeah, and, yes, of course. Like, Hugh, there's, yeah. there's a great example. And yeah. another great drummer. I, we did, we toured with uh, Huey and the boys uh, and I got to sit right behind Bill and watch him play a and great, great man, drummer, oh yeah. my god what a great drummer great yeah i know like skill uh, great yeah i'm getting goosebumps thinking about him he was so <laughs> much fun to watch and the nicest cat man yeah yeah we had fun just like you just just yeah. the most unassuming just uh yeah awesome guy and but like that you know sports record you uh, I think of that right around the same time you're talking about you know that had it had like what eight singles out of 10 songs or something on it you know incredible and you know he yeah. can play a shuffle like open simple big left hand and just nail that just incredible yeah great but yeah, yeah those were the, the and huey what a great singer and a mm -hmm. cool guy i got to hang with him a couple of times he was really yeah, fun. yeah. He's, he's great good so. Good guy, and yeah. and so the, all those years, you're you're back and forth, and and we could we could spend three hours just talking about all the songs with Brian and your approach, and and then it, it I'm guessing that through a producer, it led to you doing the cult record, Sonic Temple, like in yeah, that was um, Bob Rock. Uh, I had done a couple of things with Bob at right. Little Mountain. Uh, you know, he produces a lot of stuff, and back then he was. Uh, he had a band called the Paolas. I was a big fan. And that's when I met him uh, the first time I came up to Vancouver, 82 or something, to work with Brian. And Bob was at Little Mountain all the time working. And we got to do a couple of things. Um, I'm not sure if the cult was before or after. I did a record with a band called Honeymoon Suite, a great Canadian uh, band. And they asked me to, Bob asked me to come in and put drums on. They had done a bunch of tracks. They weren't mm -hmm. really happy with the drum tracks. So they said, maybe you can just put some drums over these tracks and we'll see what we can do with them. So uh, I, I just, you know, went in, they played the tracks. I put a bunch of drums on stuff and uh, I got to work with Bob, which is fantastic. But the cult record, he called me, um, you know, would you be interested in doing this record? And I was a big cult fan. I loved, I loved the records. Uh, so yeah, I went up to Vancouver and I met Billy and Ian and, and um, it was great. They're really fun and funny and just goofy. You know, <laughs> it was so much fun. And, you know, I, I'm, we, we rehearsed a couple of days and then we started tracking and um, we ended up uh, finishing up the Sonic Temple record. We did it in about a week. Wow. Drum tracks. And um, yeah, that was really fun. And Bob, you know, he gets those great drum sounds. You know? Oh, man. It's, that's, I get asked every once in a while, somebody will ask about uh, Firewoman, you know, the, the track. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I really, I didn't have anything to do with it. It's all Bob Rock, man, that, that you know, I just sort of pounded through. And <laughs> well, um, and then they wanted some uh, some silly fills in here and there. And we, we put it, it was once again, you know, we just did a bunch of fills and he stuck them all in there together and, there's the track, you know, and it's, I hear it now. I hear it in the radio, you know, you hear it in the car or you hear it. It's fantastic. Man. It's, it's so a, great. It's such a great song. It just, it plows right along, you know, but it's your feel Mickey. If you didn't, if it wasn't you, man, 
you're, you're killing me because if it wasn't well, you playing it, it wouldn't sound well, like that. I mean, I, it's a, I don't, I, I, I don't know about that. I just know that move. that you know those sounds. It's all, it all comes from Bob Rock's brilliant mind. He knows what he needs to get for sound, and he knows what he needs for a part. And you know, he he he's great uh, in the sense that he just lets you play. He doesn't have an opinion on anything until maybe a, a take or two. And then he'll think, why don't we try this here? Yeah. You know, maybe we need a fill here or don't do the inside left. Just, just give me a big backbeat. I don't want to hear any sort of inside stuff. Yeah. You know? uh, or, or he'll say, I need more of the inside stuff. <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. That, is, but just really, um, you know, producer worthy comments, and he's yeah. he's fantastic, and he's so much fun to work with. But he just lets you play. That's a great producer. That you yeah, know, you know, Andy was talking about that. Yeah, with John Lennon sort of acting as producer along I with. No, I know. I, I watched yeah. that, and I'm just I, we. Uh, I have to tell you, man, Andy Newmark. He's, we talked about drummers that were an influence. Absolutely one of those guys for me. I, I never met him, but I've got everything he ever played on. And uh, I am such a huge fan of his. And he's a guy, you know, uh, I'm proud to say I've stolen everything. from. <laughs> well, what I can physically do, you know, he's, he's done some things that you just can't. It's crazy. The John Lennon records are crazy. And Avalon. Yeah untouchable and jimmy malin as well my hero who i love to death but yeah, uh that's great yeah. anyway so sorry but, i didn't mean to interrupt no, 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 that's okay answer. and and, and again you're being so humble i mean i when the, the cult record mm. that the it's like where you place the beats i i can't explain it any other way and i've i've talked to you about this before it's just it's the feel yeah. of it um it, and i've told you this you remind it and and dave wasikin had mentioned this i think when you guys did the podcast that You've always reminded me of Jeff Percaro and and, oh. and and your touch, and and I've seen you play plenty of times where you you have a, you certainly don't hit the drums, you don't bash the drums, right? You you, you play with such a great finesse and touch, and you sit far back, which which surprised me the first time I saw you. How, you know, pretty far back from yeah the snare drum. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm back there. But it's but it's all you it's all the mechanics of it's it's perfect for how you play you know what yeah. I mean it's just like you and you you play that backbeat with so little physical but just such an incredible sound that comes from it yeah I I remember um, a long time ago uh, somebody said you don't have to start like in Kentucky to get a big yeah backbeat it's the way you drop the stick on the drum. This, yeah. let the stick do the work so the weight of the stick is going to give you so you know you find that sweet spot on a snare drum and i you know i'm always on the rim you know i'm always it's always a most backbeats i play are rim shots unless it's rim a big shots. unless it's a big ballad or something then you know you just get a fatter snare drum sound and hit this hit the thing dead center or i try mm -hmm. um but yeah i remember that and then you know i, I remember seeing footage of john bonham play and there's a guy, he looked, sometimes he looked like he was really bashing. Yeah. But when, when, they, when they would zoom in on his hands, he was doing the same thing. His right. hands, his arms didn't move. It's all just how he dropped that stick on the drum. Exactly. No one had a better snare drum sound in the history of recorded music than John Bonham yeah. on any Zeppelin record. Yep. Those yep. drum sounds are just the, the best. And it, it wasn't the kit. It wasn't the engineer. It wasn't the microphones. It was the way he hit that snare drum. His left hand was frightening, um, you know, how he did that. Yeah. So yeah. I always sort of thought, man, there's, you know, there's a way to get a big beat, a big back beat, a nice beefy sound without trying to crush it. You know, you don't want to crush the drum. You want to let it sort of breathe and yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. you hit it, hit it and get the stick off of there so the drum can you know, do its little. Yeah. Thing. Yep. But Bonham was the master of that, you know? Um, and I have to, uh, I have to uh, qualify that by saying um, the first two Chicago albums had the best snare drum sound ever recorded. <laughs> yeah. And I know you did an interview with Danny Serafin, who was yeah. my favorite drummer of all time. Uh, I love him more than anybody. 
Uh, oh, that's cool. And yeah. I always wanted yeah. to know uh, what snare drums he used on those first two records. And you talked to him about his piccolo and then the Dynasonic Rogers. Yes, yeah. right, right. So uh, I'm going to find one of those Dynasonic <laughs> snare drums and start using it. Because that re those records, Danny was the guy. But anyway, the backbeat thing, you know, um, how hard you hit, it's not about, you know, crushing the drum. It's really about letting that stick drop. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, and that's a, and I think too, again, I'll, I'll, because you're being humble. It's something as a drummer, you have to develop that technique too. It's not something that you wake up one yeah. day as a drummer and can and master the way you do and the way that Jeff. Well, in, it's funny that you mentioned Jeff because Jeff is Bonzo. such an influence on me. Uh, I, I couldn't, I, first of all, I can't tell you how, how uh, important Jeff Pocaro was and is to the drumming world. There, there will never be a guy like him. I spent my teenage years, late teenage years, going to record stores and find, I, I would spend hours flipping the record over, reading the liner notes and finding records that he played on. Wow. So I could take them home and copy. That's my phone, sorry. Um, but okay. yeah, no, it's, it's cool. Um, Susan's in the other room. She'll, there she is. She got it. Uh, Jeff was the, for me, uh, and I got to see him play at uh, the Powell Theater in Waterbury in like early 70s. He was playing with Steely Dan. Mm -hmm. So it was Jeff up here, Jim Hodder, who was the, uh, yeah, yeah, another. Oh my gosh. Try yeah. to play reeling in the years. Yeah. Good luck. I know. Yeah. yeah. A let lot me, of let me know if you, let me know when you get to bar four. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Let, let yeah. me know when you get to the first fill, uh, right. because you're not gonna <laughs> <laughs> forget it. No, that, that those Jim Hodder, come on. I know. He was I know. So anyway, it was Jim Hodder on, on the uh, one side, Jeff on the other side. Um, Michael McDonald was on stage. He was behind a curtain. He wouldn't come out. He playing a Fender Rhodes. Um, Danny Diaz, of course, playing guitar and uh, um, uh, um, Walter Becker was playing bass, but he was behind his, they were all hiding. They were, they must've been high as a kite or whatever and paranoid about being on set because none of us. Uh, yeah. um, and a guy wow. named Royce Jones was playing percussion and singing. He was singing all those great um, uh, David Palmer parts. David yeah. Palmer was the singer of the band. He wasn't on the tour and it was the Pretzel Logic tour. So, uh, Jeff, or it was just before Pretzel Logic. It might have been the, because uh, they played Bodhisattva. They opened with Bodhisattva. Mm. And it was just Jeff and Jim playing the drum. The boom, ka, boom, ka, boom. Yeah. I melted. I melted and I, I, oh, man. I didn't solidify again for two hours. <laughs> I just, I was just dripping off of my. I've never seen anything. Like, and then I find out that Jeff was like 19 years old. Yeah. He, he would that. have been 18 or 19. Yeah. He was just a kid. He was a couple yeah. of years older than me. Yeah. I, but anyway, I was such a fan of Jeff and, um, you yeah. know, I really, I really tried really hard. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was, I would try to channel him on a lot of recordings, you know, some of the Adam stuff. Um, I, I remember just thinking, you know, just, this do it like what would Jeff Percaro do here? Like, can you get that thing that he yeah. does? You know, there's a song called "Into the Fire" from the album "Into the Fire." Yeah, yeah. Brian Apple song, and it's if you listen to it, it's my personal tribute to Jeff Percaro. I tried so hard on that song to emulate what he would do, like some of the fills and things. You know, he, yeah, yeah. He had those great choices and. uh just the groove of death and man that's it the choice is, better. i know you're right the choice is and the groove and, and our friend dave wasikin and said yeah um cuts like a knife yeah that groove's hard. so and i think of that song too um as it, it, it's it's to me it's reminiscent of how you know jeff could dig in so deep like he would he could just dig in deep to like the <clears throat> you just know what unbelievable I mean? yeah yeah he, um it, just, it it's, didn't he, compromise. It, no. And, you know, you every I, the guy's on a million. We could talk about him for hours. He's on a million of my favorite tracks. But um, The Pretender, the Jackson Brown song. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Just crazy. Speaking of that, uh, it make, it reminds me of Seals and Crofts. And um, 
John Guerin on all the Sills and Crofts records because between Jim Gordon and Jeff and John, John Guerin, Guerin. Yeah. Those yeah. three guys, man. And yesterday was Jeff's birthday too, just coincidentally. Oh, was it? Yeah. How did you know first. that? Oh, yeah. 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 So it's something. You know, I almost, I, I, we had a guy, uh, Paul Medeiros is his name. Um, he was Toto's road manager. But he was also, uh, when he wasn't on the road with Toto, he was, he had his piano rig because he had some sort of MIDI piano thing back in the, the day and everybody was hiring him to do it. So he became our keyboard tech uh, with Brian and he was on the road uh, for a long time and I got to know Paul really well, but he, he was very close to Jeff. And um, I, I asked him one time, do you think maybe if we're in LA, I don't want Jeff to come to the show. <laughs> 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 please don't i don't want him to come to the show make sure he does not come <laughs> do i don't want jeff Procaro anywhere near i don't want him within a hundred miles of the stage that i am on or if he's there i don't time. want to know he's there but yeah. if he's in la when we're there maybe i could have coffee i'd love to meet him just yeah. shake his hand and say hello and tell him what a fan i am so paul said i'll set that up man no problem so a couple of days later, he said, look, I talked to Jeff and Jeff said, you tell Mickey when he's in LA, man, we'll hook up, we'll get together. It'd be, I would love to sit and yap with him, you know? And uh, unfortunately he died not long after that uh, conversation I had with Paul. And uh, I was heartbroken. I mean, we were yeah. all heartbroken. How can we not miss this guy? You know? uh, he was, he was just untouchable. His tracks, uh, every note, there's not a bad note. I know. I know there's not. Have you read the book that Robin Flans did? No, uh, no. I, I'm going I'm to get you a copy of it. It's, it's so great. I will find that and read it. Yeah. I know you spoke with Robin, right? About the yeah. book with, with Jeff. Yeah. It, you'll really dig it. And it's, I it's, love, yeah. I, I would love to read that. Um, I'm re I try to read all the drummers books, you know, Danny Sterford had a great book. I read his yeah, yeah. book. Um, and uh, I haven't, Robin was the first interview I ever did. How about She's, that? Yeah. She was fantastic. Man. She's she great. Was so cool and nice to me. It was really great. Oh, yeah. that's, and, and she knew Jeff really well. So yeah. It's very fitting that I'm actually, so you'll love that. And I'm actually reading Liberty DeVito's book. Oh, great. Well. I, yeah. I want to get that as well. Um, that's really good. I saw Lib uh, back. Uh, I've been to a couple of the Connecticut drum shows over the years. I don't mm. know if you ever get down because you're not I, that far from. I'm not. And I almost came to the last one or the one before. Yeah, they didn't. I don't think they had one this past year, right? I yeah. Don't think they yeah allowed, they were allowed to do it. But the year before. Uh, anyway, I, I saw two. I've seen a few guys, but two of the most amazing clinics I saw at the drum show were Liberty DeVito yep. and Dave Maddox. Dave Maddox, play, it was beautiful what he did. For an hour, he just, he just showed how to hit a snare drum different differently and you know uh his yeah. technique and his uh his feel and his touch yeah, yeah. Oh, all yeah. about dynamic it was all about dynamic. and he had those big broom things those yeah. brooms it was so beautiful to watch and he was amazing and uh, i got to say hi to him and talk to him but lib i saw liberty's thing too and he was doing a thing where he'd play along, you know, he'd play along to the Billy Joel tracks and he'd tell the stories and the stories. And he's such a funny guy and he's such yeah. a great guy. And I got to sit and chit chat with him for a while too. And it was great to hang with him, but his playing on those songs, there's a guy that, you know, the unique sort of approach that he had to everything, his energy. And he's, he's lurching constantly. He's on top. He's on top. He's yeah, on top yeah. and he's pulling and pushing and driving. And then he goes into one of those wacky drum fills, you know, or one of those where he's just smashing through this thing and it's grooving like crazy. And it's like this robot, <laughs> it's like this monster that's just sort of <laughs> falling over itself, you know? Yeah, and you yeah. can't help but get up and just jump around w w listening to him play. He was, he's amazing. And yeah, just yeah. to see him, do it with that and he's got that smile on his face the whole he's just beautiful man just beautiful and yeah. i love him i love him he's 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 one of the best ever but you're right the the you're right it's that all that energy that comes through and is playing and it's and it's it's like aggressive but it still grooves just crazy and, yeah and he wax he hits feels great he just crushes the kid he's just going and he's yeah. got all the and he's he's up here and you're hearing notes <laughs> and you're going where the fuck is that coming from? How did, 
<laughs> he's, he's all this, you know? Yeah. He's yeah. fantastic. Uh, great. I'm, I'm going to have him on next week with me next well, um, please just Friday. Yeah. You, you kiss him on the lips for me. Because he's <laughs> he's the best. Man. I will. <laughs> but you know, and one one more um, track. I'm I'm sure you know this track, uh, Jeff Picaro. But it's one of maybe one of the lesser known ones. Is the Bonnie Raitt "Luck of the Draw"? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's the the last. It's this title song of the record. Yes. yes. And the great Ricky Fatar is is on. Actually, it's Tony Bronigal that plays brushes on "I Can't Make You Love Me." Oh, is that right? I thought I always thought that was Ricky playing on everything. Yeah, that's Tony on that Ricky, one, and it's yeah. Ricky on everything else. Except How about Ricky Fatar? Not to oh. let's let's not let him slide. He, he forget about it, man. Oh, Ricky, the stuff he did with the Beach Boys, the yeah. early stuff. Oh, come on, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I am a huge, huge fan, and I love him. Man. Yeah, me too. I just me love too. his playing. So one of these days, uh, maybe I'll get to shake his hand too. Yeah. Oh, he's he's really cool. He's a sweetheart like you, I and love I you his know, playing, my, man. Plus, he produces all those records as well, doesn't he? I think he does. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say my band covers uh, a Bonnie Raitt song, "Thing Called yeah. Love." Yeah, and I love her. I, she came. Your... She came and sat in with us one time somewhere. Oh, cool! And it was just, oh my god, give me a yeah. break, man. She, she's, she's got break. such a great vibe, right? Oh, she's, just, she's so cool. Yeah, she's the sweetest and really funny, and you know, just, just beautiful. You know, yeah. it's great. I was just going to well, say. Anyway, I, I didn't mean. I didn't mean to. Yeah, Jeff. Jeff on uh, Luck of the Draw. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful playing, and and uh, and I butcher the hell out of Ricky's thing called Love. Like. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Time. Well, join the club. I'd I'd probably butcher it too. It, he's uh, yeah. He's he's got some unbelievably great tracks. His yeah. feel. But I I I remember here the first time I heard him. Uh, it was way back. He was doing, it was live Beach Boys somewhere. Yeah. A friend of mine, uh, his brother worked for a local radio station and he had all these reel-to-reels tapes and he had this great stereo system in his house. And we'd sit down in the rec room in his basement and his brother would play these, you know, his brother would like fire up some big fatty and sit over the corner. <laughs> well, he's long hair. <laughs> Just, you know, he's 35 years old. He's still living in the basement of his parents' house, but he was fantastic. He was such a uh, great um, sort of... Uh, he had all this great music, yeah, uh, these reel yeah. to reels. But I remember hearing the live Beach Boys stuff going, "Oh my God, who's playing drums?" And it was, yeah. you know, some eighteen-year-old Ricky Fatar or something. I don't know. Fantastic, yeah. wonderful feel, yeah. yeah. But Jeff was um, Jeff was uh, to get back to Jeff, man, um, untouchable and one of my heroes. And uh, you know, I always thought if I could play like anybody, I'd want to play like I'd want two bars of anything to sound like what Jeff did every note he played, you know? Wow. Just beautiful stuff, man. Well, that, that's a, I mean, that coming from you, that's, that's uh, huge praise because just crazy. just crazy. The Steely Dan records, uh, Katie lied. Um, that record, it's just crazy. And you know, Jim Gordon is on some of that. Stuff. He's on a pretzel logic record. Yeah. Jim Gordon's another guy, you know, this, this session, John Guerin, the Court and Spark record is just, just beautiful. I know, I know. He's exactly. that guy, uh, and I don't know. I gotta find. I'd love to do some research on John Guerin because he, he had those tom. Did he play concert toms or or like roto toms or something? Or he, you know, he he may have at one time. <laughs> I, I think he played. Um, I think he played Camco drums at one point maybe but were they like, open they must have been oh, no bottom head right probably no bottom heads at some point when they sound like the they almost sound like a really loose timbali some yeah. of his palm sounds and he did that thing where he'd go into a fill and it was like boxes falling down the stairs yeah it, they just tumble yeah. the fills just tumble there's, there's no sort of definition <laughs> in it but you hear a little you hear the stick hitting everywhere and you go well, well, wait a minute was that a you know, um, Ralph Humphrey does that yeah, he, yeah. on all those Zappa records. So it's the, it's, the, I just call it the boxes falling downstairs because that's what it's uh, anyway, John Guerin, another one of those great, uh, Absolutely. when I think of Jeff, I think of Jim Gordon and I think of John Guerin, you know, the, um, the other two JGs. And, yeah. Um, and, and Jim Keltner too. I think of Keltner, as, as sort of like the, the, yeah. Well, you know, Keltner, Jeff's orbit orbit. I, I think Jim is, is the guy that does all of those things. Like on any given session, he becomes that thing. Like he's, he is John Guerin, you know, 
yeah. can, he does all of that when he needs it. Um, you know, he can, he does the Jeff thing. He does Jim Gordon. Uh, there are some tracks where you think it's Jim Gordon, but it's not. It's Jim Keltner. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he's, he's sort of that chameleon or whatever. You know, he can, yeah. he can just get in there and be whatever you need him to be on that particular track. I love Jim Keltner. I, I agree. I, and I got yeah. to meet him a couple of times and, um, man, I love him. He's, he's just incredible. Yeah. Such a good drummer. I, I'm, and still like, as I don't know how else to say it, but you know, well into his seventies, he's still every bit is sort of relevant. If that's the right word. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He's yeah. Like, as a matter of fact, um, uh, I talked to a friend of mine, uh, Norm Fisher, who played bass with Brian for a long time. Um, I, I spoke to him last week. He was going into Little Mountain to do a bass track on a Michael Bublé song that Bob Rock was producing. So Norm is in Vancouver. He goes into the studio. Jim Keltner is playing drums on the track and he's in L.A. And Bob Rock is at his home studio in Hawaii. So they were trying to do this remote thing. And of course, it, it all it didn't work at all. But Norm was a nervous wreck having to play bass with Jim Keltner. He was just, you know. <laughs> Buddy, I'm shitting myself. I can't believe I got it. <laughs> so anyway, um, he said, you know, I talked to him after. I said, how'd it go with, with Kelvin? And he said, man, it was amazing. He, you know, I walk in, he says, Norm, this is Jim. You know, and they're looking at each other. And, and Jim says, hi, Norm. How you doing? Good. Okay, great. Let's go. And they try to track and they, you know, there's the delay and there's this yeah. stupid and poor connection and all that. So they ended up putting... Uh, Keltner did two takes or something. Okay, I, I guess I'm done. Bye. And you know, Norm said it was the best drum track he's ever heard. You know, <laughs> every note, it, it, it was so easy to play too. And you know, he was done and he was done in a take or two as well. But uh, that that's a great. Uh, I love that he got to work with one of the greats. You know, yeah, and, um, yeah. Keltner just does that, man. He just shows up and does that beautiful stuff. I played on an Elvis Costello record one time, and. Uh, I got to watch Jim play drums in the studio. Uh, it was on the same session and he was finishing up and then I was going in to flail away. And, you know, <laughs> one of those, really, you're going to make me follow Keltner. Uh, <laughs> so I got to watch him play one of those beautiful, he's so good. It's just crazy. Yeah. And I did a lot of those. I did a lot of work with T-Bone Burnett back in the day, the eighties, early nineties, whatever. And, uh, Jim always played on most of the tracks, Yeah, yeah. you know, and I got to play on maybe half of these records. Right. So I always got to hear Keltner's raw drum tracks before we go to do something, you know, be inspiring to. Oh, listen that's to cool. Yeah. 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 So I got to, I got, uh, you know, I got really close to Keltner without ever really knowing him, you know, and, uh, uh, it, it was great. It, it, it's really, you know, those are great memories being able to listen to a Keltner drum track before you go to track something, you know, it's yeah. inspiring. And, uh, you know, you sort of try to channel that same kind of thing, but he's, he's, uh, he's unbelievable. Um, he's, he plays really simply, but really uh, clever. Exactly. And he's that thing. Like he'll be playing along and you go, oh, that's, yeah, that's great. And that feels good. And then he plays some wacky little thing, you know, out of nowhere. And you go, how does he do that? It's just, you just, you can't wait for the next one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's really great listening to him. And, uh, and, uh, you know, and he's, the couple of times I've sit and sat with him and chit chatted, he was always really gracious and kind and really nice to me. So. And you have to know he's he's got to be as big a fan of yours as you are of him. Yeah, no, really, Mickey. And but you know what you're saying reminds me a lot of um, Dave. You know, we're talking about Dave Maddox, another guy. Yeah, plays these things that sound simple, but they're really deceptively tricky. Yeah, they're not. It's not. It sounds simple, but it's um, you know, it's really well done. I don't know if it's well thought out. But it's, you know, like, I think, I think Keltner might be one of those guys where he d- probably doesn't think too much about where he's going or what he's doing, but he's got his, um, his way of doing it. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, um, that's what makes it work for him. Yeah. You know? he, he, Rick, he, Rick Murata, another. Yeah, yeah Ricky, Rick, he's another guy, man. Forget it. All that, yeah, that stuff that sounds, and, and Gad, too, we were talking about the other day when we spoke, it just, it, it it can sound like a simple beat and then it's just wait a minute hold it yeah. you know it's, yeah 
I've I've never been more inspired by anyone than when I hear a Steve Gadd track, which is every everything ever recorded. You know, he's he's everywhere. But the classics, man, he's yeah. uh, you know, I, I listen to Asia. I know everybody goes there. I know that's the one. But it's no, it's it's a, yes. it's a yeah, pretty masterful. It, it's yeah. way beyond just drumming and drums and technique and uh, you know feel and all the things that we we go for when we're working on something. It's way beyond that. It it uh, it's just um, it's spiritual, you know. Really, really, uh, just it's fantastic. It's beautiful. And he, everything he plays is like that. I got to watch him play uh, uh, way back. Uh, he was working with Chick Corea. Um, he was in a, they were at Toad's Place in New Haven. It's a little mm. club in New Haven yeah. where a lot of bands played. And I got to see a lot of great... I saw Billy Cobham there. I saw Buddy Rich there. Um, but I got to see Steve Gadd play. And I sat right at the edge of the stage, right next to his hi-hat. And he was... <laughs> Oh my God. You know, his snare drum, he, he just, I could hear the lugs rattling. He keeps yeah. It like this, right. You, you probably know. And he had a cymbal that was just had big chunks missing out of it. You know, and he, every once in a while he'd whack away at that, but he sat so low and he sat far back. He sat back off the yeah, camp. He, he sat yep. really low, yep. but his, his, uh, I was just in awe of, uh, I mean, I sat, <laughs> I sat there all night like, <laughs> you know, drooling with my mouth open just mind boggling how good he plays and it look, he makes it look like it's, uh, it's attainable to you, you know, he, the way he plays. he's very relaxed. You have control he's, and, and yeah. uh, just his intensity, uh, you know, his dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. And he goes into these sort of fits, <clears throat> you know, when he go, he yeah. starts going for it. It's like, he's, he's just, <laughs> It's I know just, you exactly. Yeah, it's like he's having a he's, you know, it's it's really wonderful to watch him play. Well, you just reminded me of I I went to see I I was in New York for I think the jazz show. This is some years ago. You were playing at the Beacon Theater with Brian. Yeah, and you got a bunch of us tickets, which was great. And we were like in the first or second row. And at the end of the show, I, had I remember dash, that show. Yeah. yeah, I had to dash down way down to to the yeah. beacon i mean to um the blue note to see uh steve with chick Corea. you had bigger fish to fry and so <laughs> no. i understood i got to see my two favorite guys you got back to back <laughs> yeah. one than the other mickey i gotta bail there's a drummer down the road i gotta go <laughs> see man he he's needs really to he's really somewhere. good <laughs> who is it steve gad oh thanks a lot yeah. no it was great it was a, that was a fun night that, that was, was like, fun i remember yeah i i, I remember uh waving goodbye to you and it, yeah when you left, I was up on, I think we were just finishing up, right? Yeah. I got to run, man. <laughs> Say hi to uh -huh. Steve. No, that was fun. Uh, I remember that show. I love the Beacon. I love uh, those, you know, those theaters are great places to play. Drum sounds great, are always yeah. good. The drum sounds are always good on those stages, you know. <sighs> yeah. Really, really good. And the, the mix in the house was so, I just remember going like, wow, it sounds like I'm listening to a record. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like. It's it's a it's a big place, but it's not so big. Like you were saying, in the giant places, you lose all that nuance. You and do. All that. You lose you lose all yeah. that inside stuff, you know. And, yeah. um But you didn't there. You had you. It had all. Yeah. Everything, you know. Great. Yeah. Those are great. Those are great. Those old theaters, man, are just fantastic. I love them. Yeah, that was. Well, man, I I I know we're we're up. Wow, we're approaching the two hour mark. Oh no! I, okay. I hey, didn't know. I, I didn't know that. I thought we were at about maybe an hour and a half, but. All right. Well, listen, stop bothering me and uh, I'll. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to lose my number, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do me a favor, will you? Call somebody else. <laughs> you know, you should be talking to drummers. That's what you should be talking You should be talking to guys who mean something to people. Oh, come call on. Call me. What are you calling me for? Come on, man. This is, I told you this. <laughs> when I heard you and David doing the podcast last year. Oh, yeah. I, I think I laughed for about 90. I mean, I love, so you know, Dave, great. Dave and I were those, we get together. We, we met years and years ago. Um, you know, the Hooters were opening for us and, and I, you know, Dave and I became best buddies like immediately. It's like we had known each other our whole lives and he's so funny he and he's such a great storyteller. And like with you, here we are, we're almost two hours of yapping about, but 
I could spend hours talking to a guy like Dave. And besides the fact that he's a great player, he's another guy who knows how to hit a snare drum, man. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's, he's really great. Something. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, he's fun. It was, it was, it was, it really inspired me. And I, and I, it said to him at the time, I, I got to get a hold of Mickey when I start doing these again. Oh, that's nice, man. Thanks I, for doing this. It's, I, I appreciate this. It's really, thank you. it's really nice. This and I get good. to, I get to look at those two beautiful Gretsch kits of yours while I'm talking to you, man. I can, they're just beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Really cool. How do you using all those cowbells you got back? <laughs> I got hey, hey Tito Puente, you using all those cowbells or, <laughs> or what? <laughs> I do I use Come that here. one sometimes. Yeah. When we try to play good times, bad times. And, oh and, man. Is that a cowbell? That yeah. That that, he's I, playing a cowbell throughout pretty much. Yeah. <clears throat> so that is a cow, but it, it the beginning that Dude, I know, I know the, I know the sound, but uh, I'm wondering how they got a cowbell to sound like that because it almost sounds like a cross between a cowbell and a woodblock. You know it what it is? So beat up, and it was a small one, I bet too, right? Exactly. Did he exactly. use a small cowbell? That it's, a, I have a Ludwig cowbell, yeah. an old. And that's I think probably that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's very choked. Yeah, not speaking like of, what we're used to. Speaking of kick drum parts, oh, good yeah. luck with that one. I'll be calling you for some tips on that because I. <laughs> I can yeah. I can do I can do a couple of those, but there are a couple where he comes out of them, and instead of coming out on a kick drum downbeat, he comes out uh, with a backbeat as the downbeat. Yes. Yeah. Right. And it fools you because you think, oh, I got to get the kick drum to do the downbeat, but you can't get that fourth little triplet note in there, or whatever that is. Right. Yeah. I, I the first time I heard that song, I it it like blew my mind because I, I had only been listening to Ringo and Charlie Watts and, yeah. you know, I was, I was pretty young and I heard, and I'm like, that's his, that's his foot. That's his foot. How? That's I not know. right. That's I not, know. that's, the, that can't be. Well, you know, yeah. you talked to Danny, you, when you talked to Danny Serafin, you were talking about some stuff he did with his yeah you know, that quick little yeah. movie. He sure did. Yeah. yeah. Some of those, er, the, some of those records, I don't know. Cause I, I studied every note Danny Serafin ever played. He, you know, he taught me how to play drums. He really did. I, I, wow. I couldn't, yeah. The Chicago records were, there was a period of time in my teenage, when I was a teenager, he was the only drummer that existed. That's so cool. Other guy, you know, guys would go, well, how about, a, nah, nah, he ain't Danny Serafin. Danny Serafin's the guy. Well, does Danny know all, have you, you, you I spoke have... to him. Uh, uh, we had a, a, a promoter, a guy named Don Fox. He's a promoter down in New Orleans. And um, he's good friends with Bruce Allen, Brian's manager. So Fox said he knew the guys in Chicago really well. And I said, I'd love to, is there any way I could call Danny Serafin or have a conversation or just talk to him? And he said, let me, let me talk to him. And I'll, yeah. So of course, a few days later, he said, Danny would love to talk to you, man. Just here's his number. Yeah. Call him anytime. And, you know, he, he said, please have Mickey call me. I would love to say hi and talk and chit chat. So, uh, I just, I hung up the phone and I picked up the phone and I called him and he picked up the phone and we talked for like two hours on the telephone. Oh, that's so cool. This was way back. This was probably uh, 90, mid nineties. Yeah. Something, right. And uh, it just blew my mind that I was on the phone talking to Danny Serafin <laughs> about Danny Serafin. And he was, he was so kind and nice and sweet. Yeah. And, you know, uh, we just yapped man for, couple hours and it was it was just fantastic that's so another great. one of those another one of those things that just make you realize how lucky you are to be in this you know this drumming world with guys that that cool so, he's a good guy yeah yeah he, he's and really he's a guy his playing those especially the first two three records yeah uh, and then chicago Ooh. five five was pretty amazing too but the live record's fantastic the carnegie hall record yes. you really get to hear him wail like yeah and, and terry calf is <sighs> amazing on that but yeah. anyway yeah i'm i'm a huge danny seraphim fan i always was and uh i me too one me of too, my teachers yeah. he's one of yeah. my teachers and i, I big influence yeah. and i have to tell you paul jameson who is jeff yeah Carter, longtime tech he's watching and he said oh cool he was a great client and a dear friend to me the best drummer in the biz in my oh, opinion oh, yeah. oh what a guy i we love jamo yeah I we love jamo and we won't yeah. argue with that either yeah come on I love him. And uh, he worked with Jeff a lot. A lot. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, J-Mo's great. I haven't seen him in a while, but um, he's a good guy. He took care of me. 
I mean, I played on a lot of records in LA and J-Mo took care of me. He always had the gear and the stuff and yeah. his, great. His, his stuff. Some of those old great Gretsch kits he has. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, snare drums for days. So yeah, he hooked me up and he took care of me. He's got the, he's got the shit. Jim. I know he does. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know some of those snare drums are, man, but he's a good guy. I, I love him. He's great. All right, my friend. Well, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to let you have some part of your day back. Oh, well, thanks. I, uh, why? <laughs> what am I, <laughs> hey, what am I doing? Anyway. <laughs> oh man. Uh, this, this has been so great, Mickey. Uh, thank, thank you so much, John, for this. It's really been great. And, uh, oh. uh you know, I could yap about drummers and, drums for days but uh it, it, you know it's really fun to be able to do this and I, I appreciate you having this show where you know you get to talk to guys and we get to yap so well i it's no one appreciates it more than me i'll tell you oh, it's just, it's, it allows me to stay in touch with you and all yeah. my friends and yeah and and it gives everybody kind of you know all your fans a you know a, a, a peek at who you at are my living room well, I say this all the time and I'll say it to you too, that we'll do another one of these down the road. Great. You know, I would love lots that. more to talk about. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Maybe after my 114th birthday, which is in. It's month. in June. Yeah. Month and a half, two months. Yeah. I'll be a hundred. <laughs> I think it's a hundred. <laughs> Whatever. Well, yeah. hang tight for one minute. I'm going to, okay. I'm going to end okay. the live stream and then I'll come. Okay. We'll, we'll say goodbye. Right, but, um, Everybody, thanks for tuning in. Big hand for Mickey Curry. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> Great Mickey Curry. Um, thank you. And, and please tune in, uh, let's see, next Friday, as I said, the 9th for Liberty, Liberty DeVito. More to come on that. And, um, yeah, thanks, everybody. And, Mickey, hang tight for one sec. Okay. Look at that handsome face, everybody. Just, just Let me just get out of the way so you can. Handsome devil. All right. Silly. <laughs>